kick us off a little bit um, with 1031. Uh, I'm always curious to hear like the biggest misconceptions that people have about what it is. Um, Cause I think everybody or most people at some point learn about it and they're like, Oh, it's this crazy valuable tool. Um, you know, it just helps us save so much on taxes, defer taxes, whatever. Um, but with that obviously comes a lot of misinformation too. Um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you see? Yeah. So I, I suppose the biggest one is what people need to do. Well, for, or let's, I should back up. The first one is that 1031 exchanges eliminate taxes, right? And that is not what they do. They defer taxes. So somebody doing a 1031 exchange really is just kicking the tax can down the road, right? So they're just rolling their gain from one property to another. And if they ultimately sell and cash out, well, they could have a pretty extensive tax bill. So that, that's something that's important to note. And, and going along with that is people also think that they only need to reinvest their profit. And what I often find is that there's even a misunderstanding of what their profit is, mm-hmm. right? I've actually had conversations with accountants who should know better, who think, you know, they've said to me in, in conversation, like, well, my client's selling a property for a million dollars. He's paying off his mortgage, which is 700,000. He's got a $300,000 capital gain. No, it doesn't work that way, right? So mortgage debt has nothing to do with your capital gain. Basically, we're looking at the calculate capital gain. It's your sale price less your cost basis. Your cost basis consists of your acquisition costs for the property, what you paid for it, okay? Uh, any improvements that you've made to the property, capital improvements, less any depreciation you've taken during the ownership of the property. You subtract that from your sales price, that's your capital gain. To fully defer the capital gain, you need to reinvest everything. You need to buy property that's equal or greater in value to the one that you sold, and you need to spend all the proceeds from the sale. If you do that, usually the mortgage debt takes care of itself. But you know, essentially, if you're going from a million to a million, and you had uh, $500,000 of equity, and you spend that full $500,000 of equity on the new deal, you'll fully defer your taxation. So it's not just take the profit and invest it. You have to invest everything. Gotcha. And I think one of the biggest things that I've seen um, is how the debt plays into what you can and can't go into going forward. And that's always something that's confused me a little bit, not a whole lot, but it's definitely a little bit confusing. Can you explain that aspect of it and how that comes into play? Yeah. So again, you know, it's equal or greater value, spend all the money. And I always say the debt takes care of itself, which is not really true. Debt never really takes care of itself, right? You have to apply for it. You know, you have to be qualified for it. So, um, you know, so we don't really look at LTV uh, or, uh, you know, debt to uh, value ratios or anything like that. Um, But basically, although they do come into play, it's just really you have to buy equal greater value, invest your cash. And that means that you'll be making up the difference in debt. So you'll either be taking on the same or greater debt if you're going to fully defer. Uh, But you could leverage up. So if you had a property where you had a lot of equity, again, that the million dollar for simplicity property, and it was all cash, you paid off your debt, right? So you're walking away with a million dollars less, you know, closing costs, which unfortunately in our New York area tend to add up, but Mm -hmm. let's let's ignore the closing costs. So we're walking away with a million dollars. We could take that million dollars and buy a $2 million property, right? We just spend all of our cash and leverage up to the $2 million level. Uh, So, you know, that the, that the value ratio doesn't really come into play other than what the market dictates. Obviously banks are not going to give you 95%, you know, uh, you know, leverage on your money. Mm -hmm. Typically, you know, 75%, 65% tend to be more common than commercial property. So, you know, that's where the confusion comes. And that's why I really try to keep it simple. Buy for equal or greater value, spend all the money. You can go down in value. You would just pay tax on any difference. Gotcha. So, is there ever a scenario where you think it's beneficial to go down in value or not necessarily? I mean, you know, I don't, beneficial is, is kind of a subjective term, right? So Mm -hmm. we we do have clients that need the cash for other purposes. Uh, They need to pay off debt on something else. They need to send their kids to college. You know, they need to replace their, uh, you know, their old Volvo station wagon, which is falling apart. And, <laughs> you know, they, you know, so they have life needs to, to do that. I would suggest though, that there are other ways to do it, to take care of those needs, um, where you could still spend all the cash, buy a property equal greater value. And then so at some point afterwards, you can refi that property and pull cash out. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that cash is tax, you know, refi cash is tax free cash. So, you know, if you have the ability, that's probably a better way to go. Assuming of course that the, the income from the property is going to cover the debt. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, I don't really see a reason, you know, other than, you know, life, life conditions. So that's a interesting thing you bring up. Cause I know there's a lot of people out there that, uh, because because we've been advised on a couple of different situations and others have is that when you buy a property and we did this when you buy a property and then you refi it you, you don't want to do it tomorrow right you, you generally want to give it more time time heals all wounds more or less because <laughs> um, there's that always that question you know can i take some money out what are the tax consequences or can i wait uh, what do you typically advise in that situation it, you know because that's a that's a very important part to the 1031. If you can defer your taxes, refinance it, your refinance proceeds are tax-free, but you, you want to make sure you do it in accordance to what time frame typically do you recommend? Yeah. So there, there is a little bit of controversy in my industry about how long to wait, right? So there, there are people out there, very knowledgeable and astute people who have some influence and in, you know, file for a bunch of private letter rulings with the IRS. And so they know their stuff. And they've said, you know, the minimum amount of time you need to wait is one nanosecond after the closing. Okay. Uh, it's often referred to as the nanosecond rule. Uh, I am more conservative than that. I think it needs to be a completely separate transaction. So if you, if you were doing a nanosecond, that's not an isolated transaction. That means you applied like right away, um, you know, even before you close. So, uh, the minimum I would say is I recommend you do not apply for the refi until after you've closed on the property. Okay. Make it two different transactions. After that, I don't really have a great answer. <laughs> you know, the, as you said, the more time you can give it, the better you want, in my opinion, the exchange to be old and cold. I think if you were super conservative, uh, maybe not even super, if you were a conservative investor, you might want to wait till the next tax year. Right. So if you closed in July on your replacement property, wait till January, you know, to do the refi that again, that's more, you know, Mike's gut feeling than it is any kind of, you know, uh, you know, legal analysis. But you, you want to give some distance, as you said, you want to kind of let the exchange season a little bit before you, before you do that refi. Um, you no, know, that, and there's. Yeah. I was going to say that it's, it's, you know, that's more or less how we've been told to, you know, you can do it quickly. But, you know, the quicker you do it, you're, you're subject, you're opening yourself to more, you know, more questions in the future. So typically, you know, as I said, time heals all wounds. So, uh, you know, I, you know, th- that's very important for people to realize, um, you know, don't, in my opinion, and, you know, I would, you know, everyone's their own person, but, you know, g- g- let yourself breathe a little bit, right? Take, yeah, take it, a little it, bit of time pending. You don't need the money immediately. I've, I have one anecdotal story on that. So it was not a client that I re- that I did an exchange for, but they called me for guidance afterwards. Uh, they, like you said, they refied at the, the same day, you know, same closing table. And uh, it wasn't the federal government. And we find this now, it's not so much the federal government that we worry about too much because the federal government doesn't have the resources to really do a great job of auditing and catching things. Um, but New York state came back and audited or at least questioned this transaction. I'm not sure if it was a formal audit or a question. And New York state saw that the deed and the mortgage were recorded the same day. And as a result, they questioned that transaction. So they had scrutiny because they did it so quickly. So New York state is not just looking at the tax return. New York state is actually looking at property records and making a determination of how close you did things. Mm -hmm. And this applies also to some of the things that we do at partnerships as well. So you always look at your state tax regime too, if you have concerns. California and New York tend to be a little bit more aggressive than other places. I was, I was going to mention, typically it's done at the state level. So obviously when you're asking whoever's advising you, you know, where your entities are filed, where you're filing your tax term, where the property is, those are all things you, you just want to understand before you do anything. Absolutely. If, if everybody is in Texas and the property is in Texas, you know, we don't worry so much because they don't have a state income tax and there's nobody looking at it at the state level. So 100% I agree with you. So if I'm understanding the scenario you guys are talking about is – somebody buys something all cash into 1031 and then looks to refinance post closing as a way to pull some of those all cash proceeds out tax free or something like that to then go utilize somewhere else. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So they, again, they're not going to get, you know, 
95% leverage, but maybe they can get, you know, 75% and pull the bulk of their cash out. And that's a pretty common technique. And what is, I think I know the answer, but what is the purpose of, let's say it was that $2 million deal we were talking about. What's the purpose of buying that all cash and then refinancing out 1.5 million instead of closing with a $1.5 million loan and only using 500,000? Well, again, if you have ca- if you have cash left over from the exchange, you'll pay tax on that cash, right? And that's why they'll put all the cash in, and then take it out in a refi at some point down the road, right? And then I guess the other option is instead of why don't they buy a eight million dollar property and use the two million as the equity with a seventy five percent? Is that just personal preference? Is there some sort of advantageous strategy to it? Um, what is there? a blanket reasoning or no? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's your appetite as, is, as an mm-hmm. investor, right? So an $8 million property, you know, first of all, to get that loan is not, you know, mm-hmm. there's more to it than just put showing cash. Right. Sure. So, um, and you have to look at cash flow. So an $8 million property might not cash flow, you know, well enough to, you know, cover that, that difference in debt. So sure. I mean, I guess if the deal is out there and, you know, we're in the New York area, so, even now with the pandemic, I haven't seen values drop so precipitously that ca- that uh, cap rates look anything in- close to impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, with cap rate compression, I don't know that you necessarily want to go into an $8 million deal. You're probably going to be kind of at the line and you know you may not have much room to do a refi somewhere down the road, even if you have appreciation. I think, I think the other thing, and this may be more, you know, I think it's very case specific for sure. I, I think anytime you're doing a 1031 and whatever your strategy is, but I think another, another component to that, which is something we can speak about, it could also be how you identify your properties, where if you went into the identification period with, you know, one property, you could only spend your money on one property. So if you have leftover cash, you may put it in to take it out, you know, vice versa. If you identify three properties, you may not have to do that. So I think it also comes down to have identification. So Mike, if you could speak to that at all, just to give people an idea, you know, everybody has this conceptual view of a 1031, like, Oh, I'm never going to pay taxes. And it's just a walk in the park. Can you speak to some of the challenges and or different ways that you can identify property, maybe the time frame, and so on and so forth, just to get a little bit, you know, a little bit more context to some, you know, stuff where, you know, spitballing. Yeah. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it's probably the biggest concern that you have with doing a 1031 exchange is the time constraints, right? So from the closing of the sale, you have two deadlines. You have 45 days to identify the property or properties, plural, that you're going to purchase. And from the closing of the sale, you also have 180 days to close. Um, There have been some changes with the pandemic, which we can get into. They're not so relevant right now, but... um, so those 45 days, you do not have to have a contract of sale in 45 days, but you have to give your quali- typically your qualified intermediary a list of properties that you're going to identify. And typically you want to limit that list to three properties. You could go beyond that if you were buying a bunch of smaller properties than the one you were, you were buying. But typically you want to identify three. So as we were talking about, you, you, know, you mentioned buying an $8 million property. So yeah, that may be all well and good, but try finding three $8 million properties, right? You know, it's going to be hard enough to find one in this market. I mean, and that's why we see, and you probably see this in, in your business too, a lot of people are going outside of like the tri-state area. In California, a lot of people are leaving California to go to areas where prices are a little bit more, you know, competitive and make a little bit more sense. So that that 45-day crunch is, is a big issue because once the 45 days expires, you're limited to buying anything, you know, one or more of the properties that you identify, you know, so if they fall through, you're out of luck, right? You, you get your money back. It's, you know, after the 180th day and you pay taxes, uh, you cannot just go find another one. So that's, that's kind of the reality that we deal with. The 180 days tends to be a less of an issue for our clients, but the 45 days we're constantly having clients bump up against that. 